When is a hawk not just a hawk? Let's find out. Hey Revision Squad, how's it going? It's me, Liam, aka Mr Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie. And in this video, we're going to be looking at Ted Hughes's poem, Hawk Roosting, which is on page 15 of your beloved WJEC Educas Poetry Anthology. Before we get properly started, I'm going to suggest that you make sure that you have your anthology out in front of you, as well as a pen for making notes, at least three highlighters, and some extra paper for notes too. That way you're going to be best prepared to get the most out of watching this video. This video will follow the same structure as the others in this series. If this is somehow the first video of mine that you're seeing then please do follow the link in the top right corner of the screen about now. It will take you to my entire WJEC Educast Poetry Anthology playlist, which will eventually cover the entire anthology. So in this video, I will read the poem, go through its context, provide a close reading, consider the poem's mood, meaning, and the poet's motivation. I will, of course, think about themes. And then finally, at the end of the video, because I'm lovely like that, there will be an optional revision task for you to complete. If this video helps you out with your English Lit revision, then please do drop a like, subscribe to my channel and turn on that notification bell as well. There are 17 other poems that I've got videos for, and that's before I even begin to cover any of the other Lit texts. Right, so generic, cringy YouTuber self-promotion aside, here is the poem. Make sure that you're following along, either on screen or maybe slightly better, using your anthology. Hawk Roosting I sit in the top of the wood, my eyes closed. In action. No falsifying dream between my hooked head and hooked feet or in sleep rehearse perfect kills and eat. The convenience of the high trees, the air's buoyancy and the sun's ray are of advantage to me, and the earth's face upward for my inspection. My feet are locked upon the rough bark. It took the whole of creation to produce my foot, my each feather, now I hold creation in my foot, or fly up and revolve it all slowly. I kill where I please because it is all mine. There is no sophistry in my body. My manners are tearing off heads. The allotment of death. For the one path of my flight is direct through the bones of the living. No arguments assert my right. The sun is behind me. Nothing has changed since I began. My eye has permitted no change. I am going to keep things like this. So there we go. That is the poem in full. Remembering that applying context to analysis is equal to a third of the marks, I thought it would be a good idea for me to give you some contextual information. So Ted Hughes was a highly celebrated English poet and was Poet Laureate from 1984 until his death in 1998. Hughes spent most of his life living in rural areas and spent much of his youth outdoors. He enjoyed hunting, fishing and swimming. Hughes was fascinated by animals as a child. He collected and drew toy animals and would act as a 
retriever when his older brother shot magpies, owls, rats, and so on. Hughes was aware of the harsh realities of growing up in the countryside. Furthermore, Hughes's father had fought in World War I and narrowly avoided being killed. Hughes's father would often tell Hughes stories about his time as a soldier, which influenced Hughes's writing, which often features violent imagery. I wonder if we see that in this poem. Hughes is sometimes called a war poet once removed, as he did not directly fight in World War I, but he was part of a generation that felt its impact years later. And he was also too young to fight in World War II, and yet his older brother did. The image of a bird sat atop a tree was a symbol of the Nazi party in World War II, and this was called the Imperial Eagle. Between 1949 and 1951, Hughes completed his two years of national service. He was a radio mechanic for the RAF, but he said that he did little more than read Shakespeare and watch the grass grow, because those years were relatively peaceful. Hughes went to the University of Cambridge initially to study English, but he later switched to anthropology, which is the study of humans and their cultures through time. He also studied archaeology as well, and the study of both anthropology and archaeology informed his writing. And upon leaving university, Hughes had many different jobs. But something that might be a little relevant to this poem, Hughes worked at a zoo for a bit. Right, here is your last warning to get your pen, highlighters and extra paper. And now is a really good time to set up a key as well. It's always worth analysing poems titles as a title can also double up as a quotation in your exam. So here are the two questions that I will be considering with relation to the poem's title. Remember that I provide these questions for you first so that you can make your own annotations first or use them as discussion points with your classmates if you happen to be revising together. Simply put, if the hawk is in the title, that suggests that it is probably going to be quite important to the poem. Roosting means resting and is a word that is usually used when talking about birds. If the hawk is roosting, that suggests that it feels comfortable and safe. After all, it wouldn't rest if it knew it was going to be eaten, would it? and it also feels in control. And here we have the poem's first stanza, and for it I have provided one, two, three, four, five, six questions. So have a look at those questions, have a think. What answers do you have for them? Please do let me know down in the comments section. The pronoun I establishes that the poem is being told from the first person perspective. The hawk, in this case, controls the poem. The hawk's physical position could indicate its power. Generally, the higher up something is, the more power we associate it with having. The hawk is at the top of the wood, suggesting that it is the most powerful thing in the wood. This is also where the potential Nazi symbol comes into play. Although Hughes was known to say that the hawk in this poem is just a hawk, uh, and not the Nazis and so on, certainly a bird sat at the very top of the wood is that imperial eagle. 
the hawk has no need for fake dreams as its reality is perfect. This quotation helps to get across the idea of the hawk's arrogance. The repetition of hooked emphasises the hawk's potential for violence as hooks can be used to pierce and wound. The fact that the hawk is weaponised from head to toe makes it a living weapon and therefore potentially violent. The bottom line of this stanza is a very useful one as it makes the hawk's power and violence really emphatic. Here we could get the impression that the hawk is like a dictator or a psychopath as it takes great pleasure from murdering. So the poem's only rhyming couplet emphasises the idea that it contains. The hawk's kills are precise and perfect, just like the rhyming couplet, which makes the hawk sound like an expert in the area of murder. Here we have the poem's second stanza, which I'm only giving one, two, three questions for because I'm nice like that. So there are the questions, but what are your answers? Convenience and advantage are words that suggest that the hawk thinks that the world has been designed just to suit it. I've thrown in the exclamation mark too, as a hawk seems to be reveling in just how perfectly the world suits it. I think this all shows the hawk to be arrogant. And there we have my comments on what the effect is of the personification on this stanza's bottom line. In short, it makes the hawk look more important than the earth, because the hawk is above it. I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of inspectors, be that police inspectors, ticket inspectors on trains or buses, or even the dreaded Ofsted inspector. Inspectors have power over the people or things that they inspect, suggesting that they are superior. There's almost something a bit sinister about the hawk being an inspector, because we know that it's ruthlessly violent. And here is the next stanza. There's a few more questions this time, although they are mostly about what the lines mean, so hopefully they're not too daunting. There are in fact one, two, three, four, five lines. So there you go. What do you think? The consonants in locked and bark emphasizes the hawk's firm, almost harsh grip. This is because the consonants, which is the repetition of consonant sounds in this line, repeats the harsh k sound. Repeating harsh sounds creates a harsh tone, and that reflects the harsh content. The image on the top line of this stanza makes the hawk appear sturdy as locks are symbols of security and strength. Creation is capitalised as it is a reference to the Christian God. And that's quite important because when the hawk says that it took the whole of creation to create it, it means that it took all of God's effort to create it. This suggests that the hawk thinks it is God's masterpiece, showing it to be massively arrogant. And then by holding God and all that he has created in one foot, this bottom line shows how the tables have turned. The hawk believes that it is now more powerful than God. 
I've given the poem's fourth stanza five questions. One's already up on there, and then we have another one, two, three, four, to make five in total. So those are the questions, but what are your answers? Again, please do let me know down in the comment section. Revolve it all slowly highlights the hawk's arrogance as it thinks it can force creation to do whatever it pleases. It is literally making the whole world revolve around it. Monosyllabic language, which is just words that consist of only one syllable, is used to express this idea I kill where I please because it is all mine in a matter of fact way, even though it's something incredibly shocking. This suggests that the hawk is incredibly confident and comfortable with its power. The second line of this stanza is end stopped and it suggests that the hawk thinks that its say is final, nobody can change its opinion or argue against it. Additionally, the line has come to an end, just like the lives of the things it chooses to kill. In the line, my manners are tearing off heads, there is a juxtaposition between politeness, as seen in manners, and violence, tearing off heads. Now this could present the hawk as a dictator-like figure, because dictators are known to publicly appear very positively, and yet in private may conduct atrocities. Tearing off heads is an incredibly violent image, and yet the hawk expresses it incredibly simply. This suggests that violence does not shock the hawk, and that it quite likes being in power. Here we have the poem's penultimate stanza. It contains possibly my favourite quotation from the whole poem, the allotment of death. Only three questions for this stanza. One, two, three. So how about you give them a go? I'm sorry to say that this is where part one of my analysis of hawk roosting comes to an end. So those questions that were on screen just a moment ago, you're going to have to maybe work through them on your own first just for now. Part two is coming very, very soon. But to make sure that you don't miss that, why not subscribe to my channel, Dystopia Junkie, and turn on that notification bell as well. So that way you'll get a notification as soon as it does drop. As ever, thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope you have an awesome rest of the day. Cheers.